The House will have under consideration Senate Bill 1179, good gentleman from District 4. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Consent is needed. No need to be repeated. Do you hear a crow? <laughs> You've heard the unanimous consent request. Is there an objection? Hearing none, the good gentleman has the floor to open the debate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Senate Bill 1179 is the original fiscal year 2022 appropriation bill for college and universities. So Lewis Clark State College, Idaho State University, Boise State University, and University of Idaho. Um, folks, this budget was drafted approximately six weeks ago, uh, which in uh, what's feeling like right now an eternity ago. Uh, and I, I think we all recognize that uh, the, the, the grounds of the game have, have potentially changed. And uh, when we originally drafted this budget, I think we had two main objectives. First one uh, was to listen to, to the members and their concerns about some of the things that are, that are potentially happening and, and are happening in our colleges, college and universities, and concerns about uh, the direction in which we're moving. And so uh, we, we made an attempt to address those issues through uh, the budget. Some have appreciated that attempt, some have not appreciated that attempt. Uh, the second part we, we really listened to was uh, members telling us that they wanted to avoid uh, seeing tuition increases uh, at any of our institutions to benefit our students. And so that was another primary attempt of this particular budget was to ensure that students didn't bear the brunt of future tuition increases. Uh, in the last six weeks, things have changed on the ground, and, and I think we recognize now that this probably isn't the budget that will meet those requirements and needs. And there are certain particular ways that we can go about uh, doing the process of, of uh, drafting a, a new budget to uh, ensure that we meet the needs of our college and universities uh, and to help our students move forward in the best way possible. Uh, we felt the cleanest way at this point was honestly just to bring it to a vote. Uh, and see what happens. Um, at this point, uh, kind of a strange thing, but I'm gonna actually encourage a red light on this uh, bill and return it essentially to JFAC so we can uh, draft a new piece of legislation. Uh, and uh, we, will, we will try to do uh, uh, what would, would be best for our college and universities and our students in the state of Idaho uh, bring back a new budget. So uh, thank you for your time. And uh, like I said, I encourage a, a red light at this time. Is there further debate? Mr. Speaker. Uh, gentleman for two. Yeah, you heard it right. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I have a question about some of the substance here in terms of uh, like Section 3, but uh, it doesn't sound appropriate to begin to address any of these questions if we're the sponsor saying, why are we hearing this bill? Should I ask for a point of order? Um, or we could vote. I'm going to assume that this is not going to pass and not cause any turmoil. Thank you. Thank you. Gentleman from 13. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I know the fate of the bill, but I am going to debate the bill because what I have to say, I would like to be taken into consideration when the good gentleman uh, from Northern Idaho chooses to set this budget. I'd ask unanimous consent, Mr. Speaker, to read from an email from a student from Boise State University dated uh, March 2nd, 2021. Without objection, there's been an objection, but we don't object from our seat. We stand up, we object. I recognize that there's an objection from, dis from the good gentleman from District 15. So you may paraphrase, you may describe, but you cannot read. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And um, Mr. Speaker, point of order, can I move to read this? Motion's always in order. I move to read this particular email from a student of Boise State University because it is critical to what's going to be happening with regards to setting policy at Boise State University. We have a motion before us that the gentleman be allowed to read the email. Is there debate on that motion? Gentleman from 13. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the good gentleman's attempt to cut this off at the pass and to try to get this 
budget back to Boise or back to JFAC because he understands the uh, fate of what's going to happen with this budget. But there is issues with regards to what's happening in our universities, and since we have uh, proof from a student who I know personally that has emailed me, I would like that to uh, be written or read into the record. And for members as they're considering those budgets uh, moving forward, they would have a flavor of exactly what students are facing. And so I'd ask for permission to this body to read portions of this email. Is there further debate on the motion to read? In, 19. In, indeed, Mr. Speaker, I'm opposed to the motion only because uh, this isn't a, a criminal case. I don't need proof of anything. And if the standard that is being established here for justifying reading emails, I've received countless emails from students. And you don't want me reading those because they too are germane to the conversation that we might have. So I think we should probably just stick with paraphrasing. Is there further debate on the motion to read the email? Hearing none, then the debate is closed. The question before us is, shall the gentleman be allowed to read uh, from the email, the aforementioned email in his debate? Clerk will unlock the machine and the members will record their votes. Does every member voted? Yes, they have. Does any member wish to change his vote? The clerk will lock the machine and record the vote. Vote count shows 54 in favor with 15 against and one absent. The motion has uh, carried. The gentleman has the floor to debate and read from the aforementioned email. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members of the body. Here's the email. I am a student at Boise State this year in the music department. This year has obviously been very challenging in education as a whole due to the pandemic and everything else that went on. However, it seems during these times, professors are choosing to use their influence as educators to sway the minds of people and are directly backing and encouraging one-sided political ideologies, and is the, as is the case last summer with respect to candidates running for office. My guess is that this is a large violation, not only of their campus employee contracts, see the screenshots below, but also in violating the taxpayer dollars that fund the university because it only backs one viewpoint on most everything. Some of the things that we were taught or was said in class, and I quote, if you are not doing X, Y, or Z, you are racist. Your, music's, your music needs to have a political motivation behind it or it's invalid, end quote. Quote, black composers and their music should be played over that of white composers, end quote, and a lot of, and a lot of crit critical race theory type things. I have specific evidence and proof that I can get for you if anything is needed. I will skip down. Not only this, but I had personally been silenced in class for speaking my mind in open discussion setting. A professor was calling on students individually to hear their thoughts on how black composers' music is superior to that of white composers and how it needs to be elevated. My peers all agreed that this was the case. And when it got to me, I started to say, quote, I do not believe skin color or ethnicity has anything to do with the quality of music you can write or perform, end quote. I was promptly told to, quote, be quiet, end quote, and, quote, we need to move on before I was even allowed to defend myself, let alone finish the sentence. There is an entire a group of the American population that holds viewpoints that aren't being represented or allowed to be discussed without great scorn from the professors and other faculty. I do so um, <clears throat> not only this, but I've also been personally silenced in class for speaking my mind in open settings and told that my work is, um, let me skip down. This is not only occurring in the music department either, but incur, incur, occurring all over campus, sometimes in the most direct sense, but such as in regards to the big city coffee shop scenario. There were professors who were encouraged, that, who encouraged the protests that took place, calling students to action against the coffee shop due to the thin blue line that was displayed on the other side of the shop that was located off of campus. 
This, Mr. Speaker, and I could go on for quite some time, but I think you get the flavor of exactly what's happening at my institution of higher learning where I am an alumnus. I'm disgusted. I'm embarrassed and I'm ashamed. And I told the government affairs director when he came in my office to lobby me on behalf of this budget that I would read this. And I told him one of the things that I respected about Boise State University when I attended there was the vast majority of my political science professors, I could not tell what their political ideology is or was. If I took the conservative approach, they took the liberal approach. If I took the liberal approach, they took the conservative approach. They encouraged discussion. They encouraged thought. They wanted to make you think, and they wanted to make you understand what it was like to, to convey your thoughts in the real world and to defend your thoughts and your positions in the real world. That is not happening at Boise State University today. There has been a direct shift in the ideology that's being taught at Boise State University. I debated against this budget last year. I intend to debate it again until this issue gets fixed. Our tax dollars, the money that we are appropriating, and it's my understanding they're going to get $39 million of additional federal money this year to higher ed, does not be, need to be spent silencing kids' voices on, the, on our college campuses. I fundamentally and strongly believe in an individual's right to speak their mind and to debate their opinion. That's what we do in this body, and we should not be seeking to silence their voices. Secondly, the proportion of ideologies that are antithetical to what this country was founded on, I have strong objection to. And so, Mr. Speaker, I know this budget's gonna, gonna die. But I'm asking the folks that when they go into JFAC, that they call those college presidents forward and ask for change to take place at our institutions of higher learning. We can do better. We should do better. We must do better. And so I urge your red light. Thank you. Jeller from 15. Mr. Speaker. To the to the to the debate that was just given, uh, it was let's everyone remember that we were debating the higher ed budget, and uh, while there are, are maybe policy things that anyway, we'll, we'll tighten I, this. I'll up be very brief. Go ahead. I don't believe that we should be holding the uh, the budget for higher education hostage to uh, what essentially was just presented to us as hearsay. Uh, we have no idea if what we just heard is actually true. Mr. But Speaker, if I object. It is, but if it is, there, okay. but if it is, there are processes to work through the administration to deal with that instead of holding our this, the entire state higher education budget hostage. This is not the way we should be making important decisions like this. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I object that that was called hearsay. I know this individual personally. I've gone to church with this young man. This young man was scared to write this email for fear of retribution. He put that in his email, so I did my best to do not disclose who this individual is. It is not hearsay, and I object to that. All righty. Um, Delmont District 21. Um, Mr. Speaker, body, um, in similar vein to Representative, uh, I, I would like this comment to be considered when we go back to JFAC and reconsider this budget. Um, I've been made aware that just recently Congressman Fulcher uh, sponsored or co-supported uh, what's called the One Subject at a Time Act federally. And I think we should consider applying that similar principle when it comes to meeting the needs and tailoring our support for the universities. And I think that um, addressing the individual budgets individually would allow us to, again, meet those needs in a more tailored fashion. So when we go back to JFAC, I would like to have that concept considered uh, just like it's being considered now at the federal level. Is there further debate? Tell them from two. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, if I may ask a question of the sponsor, will he uh, stand for a question, Mr. Speaker? The good gentleman from District 4 yield to a question. Gentleman yields. Gentleman yields. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good gentleman. There on Section 3, exemptions from object and program transfer limitations. I don't know what object means. Can you help me understand what that is to what that is referring? Uh, gentleman from four. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good gentleman from two. So uh, this is pretty standard for the college and university's budget and in some other budgets. Um, essentially, we have object code classifications, which would include 
uh, personnel costs, capital outlay, operating expenditures, trustee and benefit payments, and, and those are kind of JFAC terms that we utilize, and, and uh, sometimes uh, when we assign dollars to those buckets, if you will, uh, some of them have to stay in those buckets and some of them can, can move between buckets. When we, when we provide them with this, uh, uh, we provide college and universities with greater leeway so that they can move within those buckets more easily. And this is something that's standard over the years that's been included in the college and universities budget. Follow up, Mr. Speaker. Uh, will the gentleman yield to another question? Gentleman yields. Gentleman yields. So to be clear, an object is a bucket. Gentleman from four. Mr. Speaker and, and good gentleman, uh, not in a literal sense, but in a, <laughs> in a uh, parlance of, of finances, yes. Follow up, Mr. Speaker. Uh, will the gentleman yield to another question? And gentleman yields. Gentleman yields. Thank you. So as I read this, uh, good gentleman, Am I correct in understanding that the uh, state board or the empowering board can move money between universities at their will? Uh, gentleman from four. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker and good gentlemen. I am not 100% uh, uh, certain on that particular question. Uh, when we talk about moving between object codes, uh, I'm generally thinking within the institution, so the University of Idaho can move money potentially that was originally allocated for personnel costs to operating expenditures, for example. I know in the past there has been an instance where uh, some money was moved between institutions by the State Board of Education, but I think that's been an incredibly rare experience. Now we're from two. One more question, Mr. Speaker. Gentleman yields for another question. Gentleman yields. Gentleman yields. So with respect to the reference to programs here, then is it the case that program money between institutions could then, it is possible, this language actually allows for that movement of finance between universities, between institutions for the purpose of specific programs. Is that accurate? No one from four. Um, Mr. Speaker and good gentlemen, I, it ultimately is up to the State Board of Education and the individual institution leadership and in how they uh, essentially assign these, these funds to, to programs and, and different programs. Sorry. Thank you, good gentlemen. Mr. Speaker, my comment. If this actually undermines our ability to have any control over which institutions are or programs money's coming from, I would just ask JFAC to consider the language in this what has been representative standard language, that they consider this language in terms of our ability to control this money or whether or not we're going to have that control. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, thank you. Is there further debate? Hearing none. Uh, gentleman from 34. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'm pleased to hear that uh, the sponsor wants to um, wants us to vote no on this bill and, and uh, essentially send the budget back to committee. I just want to be clear on, on what a no vote on this does. It, it says we're rejecting this budget. It does not say we're rejecting higher education by any means, but saying that this budget is not, uh, not what we think is appropriate for our higher education at this time. We are all aware of the problems going on in higher education in Idaho. It's become a, a, a spotlight of attention on, on uh, Idaho values, American values, and what, our, what higher education stands for. Idaho is being watched uh, across the country. We have seen in Idaho, just to point out a few items, um, there's problems with social justice and critical race theory, not just being taught, but being uh, activated on campuses, promoted, using university resources, using taxpayer dollars. And just to be clear, I handed out a definition on what critical race theory is. There's various definitions, so, um, uh, but all of them have to do with generally this, dividing, dividing people into categories. It is identifying some sort of an aggrieved minority who is being oppressed by some sort, sort of oppressive majority, um, oftentimes termed as, as those in white privilege. It is a systemic problem at our universities. It's baked into the curriculum and into the campus culture. It is going to take 
effort to remove it. One way, you know, we've tr this body tried to send the message last year by, by uh, um, taking three tries at the budget. The hope was that higher education would get the message and show positive action towards having a higher education system that better matched the values in Idaho. Unfortunately, uh, it seems to have doubled down on its social justice mission and critical race theory. Just recently, you've heard of uh, University Foundation 200 courses being canceled or at least um, uh, paused at, at Boise State University because of treatment of students based on their values that they've expressed in class. Uh, a business on the Boise State campus has been essentially forced off campus, and now there's a lawsuit out there that Boise State is going to have to defend against to the tune of a uh, $10 million lawsuit. Uh, Boise State College Republicans came uh, to the Capitol and, and expressed to some, some legislators here the stories of the treatment that they've had in classes and some of the assignments that they've had to complete, which includes explaining how their white privilege has benefited them. The Boise police contract has been adjusted midstream to require Boise uh, police officers to engage in implicit bias training, something that was not part of their contract. Um, we've seen uh, uh, support for um, social justice groups, including Black Lives Matter, and their presence on campus. In an email, I have an email from a professor who uh, is encouraging students to uh, participate in Black Lives Matter protests and telling them how to do it, what to do, what to say to officers, how to deal with tear gas in their eyes, basically a training uh, program for, for being a, a good protester. We see uh, kind of a, a new form of segregation where we have separate graduations on campus based on either uh, sexual orientation or gender identity or um, uh, the race that you belong to. Departments and offices on campus. Uh, recently, an adjunct professor from one of our universities was arrested for vandalizing a statue in a public park. Uh, the, the definitions that I've given for critical race theory, again, reinforce the point that uh, what we see happening on college campuses does fit this definition. I also included a statement from one of the academic programs on the Boise State campus, and you can see how in their description of their own department, they're actually including this as part of their department mission um, by identifying and yet, as faculty who are predominantly white, notice they're categorizing people according to race, and hold privi privileged places in our communities, we understand the importance of our own individual and group anti-racism anti education. I understand the noble intentions, but the process of doing that reinforces exactly the problem we're talking about. On the back side of that same page, I've included two sections of the Idaho Constitution that talk about how appropriation should not go for sectarian purposes. And if you look at the definition of sectarianism, it is exactly what we've talked about with critical race theory, dividing people into subcategories according to their groups or identities. And uh, any funding that we're sending to universities that reinforces this on our campuses is unconstitutional. Uh, there's been a lot of questions about just how much money that is. I've also handed out a document that identifies about $20 million of where, where this uh, public money could be being spent for these items. Now, I'm not asking for when this budget gets sent back to JFAC to adjust the budgets necessarily by the full $20 million, but we know at least some of that money based on what we've seen on campuses, is going for these purposes. So I would suggest that some fraction of that, maybe a fourth of it, maybe, maybe a fifth of it, $4 million, for example, adjust the budgets by that amount, include intent language in there that reinforces our constitutional imperative that none of this appropriation should go for social justice or critical race theory programming and activism on campuses. And so as we reject this budget today and send it back to JFAC, we ought to give that kind of direction to JFAC that we expect a budget back 
with a significant cut that at least sends the message and also gives the universities the opportunity to demonstrate that they are willing to make the changes needed to make us feel comfortable about funding higher education that matches Idaho values again. So hopefully that can be the message we send today. We can talk about the intent language too that makes sure that that money is spent uh, according to our constitutional imperative. And uh, I'm, I'm eager to vote no on this, but I'm equally eager to vote yes on a budget that matches uh, what we wanna see happen in higher education. Thank you. Uh, good lady from District 35. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So um, when I knew this was going to come up, um, I got a little information. So I started looking on the websites for our uh, universities. Um, and speaking of campus culture, there's an, the offices of workforce diversity. And these administrative branches provide faculty members with implicit bias training and require those who want to serve on search committees to undergo, undergo this implicit bias training. And it's not required by law, but the U of I, we'll pick on the U of I now, uh, claims that all aspects of its hiring process are dictated by law, but it provides no ep evidence that implicit bias training um, is required by law. Um, one thing that really, set me back was the bias response teams. So um, they're dedicated to enforcing social justice. And this team is responsible for gathering reports of bias incidents. Um, and this can include any word or action that offends social justice advocates. Intent does not matter in the definition of bias. Uh, it's on the website, right on the website, that I could read off my computer. It says, regardless of intent, we review the impact the action or statement has on others, and therefore... I'm going to interrupt. After our reading concerns earlier, I'm going to call out reading uh, without okay. unanimous consent okay. and or a motion. So uh, the lady okay. may paraphrase. Okay. I'll the do that. lady may do whatever it is except for read from okay. quotes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll do that. So um, one final point on this, that um, students and faculty can be uh, voluntary informants. And they are encouraged to um, gather information, report incidents from off campus as well as on campus. And to me, that's, that goes way beyond um, what, what I think should occur, what I think most of us think should occur, reporting things like that. Um, the only other thing that, um, for another example, you can, you can look this all up on their websites, but our taxpayer dollars are paying for these things. Um, there's an Office of Residential Life and let's see, um, oh, the U of I has uh, established living, learning communities. And one of those includes housing units that have things like gender inclusive. It's right here. And I won't read it off the computer. <laughs> but um, this, these housing options provide an environment where housing is not restricted by our traditional limitations. And these are things that are paid for by our tax dollars. Um, I know so many of us know or are part of families that work very hard to pay our taxes, to be responsible, to get up every morning and work, and to have our money going for this. So I would really implore JFAC when this goes back to committee that you will consider these things and, and that we will reinstate education and not just this bias training and and um, what I consider indoctrination. Thank you. Is there further debate? Uh, good gentleman from District uh, 12. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to give an example of a constituent, and uh, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not given to emotion, but I might get a little emotional on this one. 
All right, I'm going to remind the body that uh, this is a budget bill, and so all the litany of, of things that are out there that offend us need to have direct nexus back to the budget as best you can. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and money is near and dear to my heart. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> going more, to college more is More truer a... words have probably never been spoken. <laughs> You have the floor to debate the budget bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Going to college is a very special, formative time of life, and for those of us who went to college, it, it was wonderful and transformative for most of us. Uh, I'm going to tell you about one of my constituents, a Caucasian Christian girl. Um, I went through this with her, and uh, by the way, we have the power of the purse, and that's why I bring this up, and it applies to the discussion here. She was an English literature major, an A student, finishing her junior year. During her time there, she's walking across campus and she has very curly hair, a white girl, that's why I mentioned she's Caucasian. And she's approached by other students and told, you're misappropriating your race, because they thought she had a perm. Um, she's very Scottish. Um, she had to go through the tunnel of shame, maybe you've heard of that. This girl, uh, raised in a Christian environment, good girl, just wants to be a great English major, probably a teacher. She goes through the tunnel of shame where these uh, men are screaming F words at her. It's a requirement that she go through that as an English major. And she's a tough girl uh, emotionally, but it was pretty rough when she came back and told me about that, that she had to do that as an English major. She's in her geology class and, and she couldn't use biologically correct pronouns, he and she. Why, is, why am I being told this in geology? Um, she's in her English class and told the same thing. And then just some absurdities, like one student who is not blind raises their hand in her class and says, I identify as blind. Well, the student's not blind, but the professor, okay, yeah, we all need to honor that. Um, she was ridiculed in her English class when they were asked, well, what's your goal in life? What do you want to do? And of course, she wanted to be an English teacher, if I recall correctly. Uh, she says, well, but first I want to get married and, and raise a successful family. She was mocked by both the professor and the other students. Um, and then she brought about this pretty low morals at BSU. Uh, my professor more than once has said, class is canceled in an email because I have a hangover. Um, I, I bring that up because this type of thing has permeated the entire university, not just these classes or universities. Uh, as an A student finishing her junior year, she came to me and she said, Dad, I'm tired of, tired of paying for this crap. She quit. She's never finished college. She has a successful career otherwise. But I want to exercise the power of her purse today, our purse today. That's all we have. You cut this dang budget a long ways. Thank you. A uh, good lady from District 18. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, to debate slash discuss this budget. Uh, all right, let's get back to, to debating the budget. Yes. Uh, well, as long as we're all But as sharing. long as, but the, the die has been cast, and mm -hmm. I've allowed leniency here to describe the lit, you know, the perceived wrongs at this university because, anyway, so I, I'm sure you won't, but let's not um, anybody. Thank you, Mr. Anybody. Speaker. I expect to hew rather closer to the subject of the budget than, than many of the debates we heard. Uh, just Maybe as long I as we are... say it more than you needed to hear it, but that's... <laughs> uh, no, I, as long as we're up here sharing stories that we've heard, um, you know, this is, this is kind of my university. I my, my district comes right up to the edge of BSU, and I think it's important that I share some of the stories of the thousands of people in my district that I've spoken to who have either attended BSU or whose kids have attended BSU, gotten fantastic educations, seen their quality of life increase dramatically, seen their incomes and professional futures increase dramatically um, as a result of the wonderful work done at this university and in other universities around Idaho. Um, and I also wanted to speak up for the many businesses um, that have benefited greatly uh, from an educated workforce from the people that have gotten their education at the fine universities of Idaho. Um, and for the sake of the people of Idaho, the students of Idaho, the parents of Idaho, and the businesses of Idaho, um, we do them a tremendous disservice by not funding the jewels of our state, which are our universities. Is there further debate? 
Down from 12. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just a couple of things. I think our JFAC committee uh, hears this group very loud and clear. Um, I want to make a couple of comments. Number one, uh, universities do not transfer funds between universities. That does not happen. Uh, there are grant dollars that are available, but they do not transfer. I just got that verified. Um, additionally, um, I hear loud and clear what everyone's saying, and I understand. Um, I will share, if I might, um, Mr. Speaker, that myself and the, my good co-chair uh, received a seven-page letter from the president of the university. And the last sentence in that letter said, no state funds are used to support these activities. I don't believe that. Uh, therefore, you'll be seeing a different color that I normally would push on this bill as well. And I understand that it would be coming back. I would also encourage this body. This is more than a budget issue. This is a germane policy issue. I have said that for at least 40 days anyway however long we've been here. And I will repeat that consistently, that that's what needs to be done. Now, I know dollars are valuable. Dollars get people's attention, but if we're gonna make something happen, it needs to be through the germane policy process. What else was I going to say, Mr. Speaker? Um, there is language that's in this bill. Uh, you can see it in the sections. We're gonna hold them accountable. I have another piece that will be added to that, assuming this bill comes back, that will also ask, uh, and it's up to our legislative council, that our state auditor can audit their books to verify if any state dollars are used to fund these activities. And that's really what needs to be done. Uh, we just didn't have time to do that this year, but our own state auditor can do that and verify that state dollars are not being used to fund these activities, especially when the president makes that statement in a letter to us. So beyond that, um, you've heard the term, Mr. Speaker, as the crow flies. Uh, if that crow gains wings, uh, it probably ought to come to the chairman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, good gentleman. Is there further debate? Uh, gentleman from 22. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll try to be brief. I would be remiss if I didn't um, stand up for my kids, who I've had uh, three students go to BSU. Um, one of those is also uh, attended at, at the University of Idaho as well. I think I'm well familiar with the university program here in Idaho, um, having uh, you know three graduates from those programs. Um, you know, I just got off the phone with one of them. He had a problem with the title that he needed me to fix for him something. But I asked him, I said, you know, you're, you're, you're going to BSU right now. Tell me your experience and how do you feel? And he said, well, I can't say anything. So what do you mean? He says, well, I get, everybody jumps on you and you get, you get, you know, outcast if you say anything. I said, they've done that to you? And he said, well, yeah, a little bit, but I've watched guys in my class and had named off a class and he gave him the example. And he said, and this poor guy just brought up some factual information and uh, was ridiculed, told that his opinion didn't matter and to keep his mouth shut. This is not an isolated circumstance. Over the summer when I started learning a little bit more and talking to my kids a little bit more about this, these programs and such, what they were being exposed to, I said, you know what? I will never be voting for another one of these budgets. As long as there's state dollars going to this school, then it should be a uh, state-run university. Now, if it's a private university, teach whatever you want, that's to be expected, do whatever you want. But as long as there's money coming from the state, then we have a say in it. And I do agree, the good, good gentleman there, the chairman there, he's right, this is a lot of policy issues, and we should be addressing it in policy issues. But we don't necessarily always have those opportunities to discuss policy issues on, uh, on those things. And I have one tool, and that's my vote. That's the tool I got. Um, I can write letters, those don't always get published, but that's my tool, and so that's what I'm gonna do. And I have to exercise the tool that I have to vote no on this budget. Um, and uh, I'm not sure how much you could cut to make this to where it's acceptable, but it's, uh, it, there's a problem, and we need to address it as a uh, legislature. Is there further debate? Good lady from eight. 
Thank you, Speaker. Um, I wasn't going to stand up and talk, and I'll be brief, too. But I'm on the Education Committee, and I will tell you that I think that when we had the president of BSU come and talk to us about how wonderful things are going on campus, and we all knew different. And one thing we asked about on the critical race theory, uh, free speech zones, and all of these other issues that have been popping up and that we've all been made aware of, is the fact that these foundational classes, uh, the 200 level classes that they have to take multiple of, which we used to have to take called a humanities class in college, we had to have a three hour pencil drawing class or I don't know, Mid-Eastern studies or something like that. They have a multitude of them and they're all fit into this critical race theory, diversity, ethnicity, whatever, that those are the classes that they fall into. We asked President Trump to send us as a committee the syllabi of those classes classes to let us see what we're hearing about. Numerous times I brought up, I haven't seen those yet. Are we ever going to get them? We have never received them. That was over, what, two months ago, close to two months ago. So we have no transparency when we ask the president of a university where this information is at and was not revealing. It's not that easy to get a syllabi because these professors think it's their own personal information. This is a public university. We need to know what they're teaching these kids. So that, that's, that's first and foremost. And I guess the only thing I need to say is that it is unbelievable what the students of Idaho have been going through. And we, they've been pleading with us. And I have one kid, uh, one student from District 8, I'm not going to mention any, get it more localized than that, but this student was running for a position on the student council because there was a picture of him with President Trump from a conservative conference that he went to. He was removed off of the ballot. This is the kind of thing most of you don't know about. I w I'm not supposed to say anything, and again, I've, I've got a large district, so try to pin them down. But anyhow, the fact of the matter is, until that person has their degree, they're not gonna talk about it. Because if not, they're not gonna get it. So that, that's a high, high, high bar that we need to bring back down to where these kids can have a good education without fear, fear of professors, presidents, and that's not even watching what's happening. So we need to do something and reduce this budget immensely. Thank you. A good lady from District 26. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, likewise, I realize the, the tenor of what I'm hearing on this budget is disturbing. For us to say we have elected 18, 20 people that are appointed to JFAT, and now 70 of us are coming up and saying, I want you to listen to me. I want you to do this. I want you to do that. We have 18 people, 20 people, excuse me, on JFACT, that I consider my colleagues equally trained, all diverse backgrounds. I just said a horrible seven letter word. Um, but you know what? If we reject that budget, that's absolutely all right. For whatever reason. I've heard some awful statements today. Some are, you know, we all believe they're true. I can show you the other side of those emails likewise. We've absolutely made our universities look like the dredge of the United States. And that's not true. They may be doing things or have courses that we don't like, but we can say that about anything in our world. They have some pretty good courses and pretty good programs, likewise, that they turn out for our state. We sit here and we've judged hearing from the presidents, whether you like them or not, we all look at it from a different perspective. It is perspective. And I trust my colleagues. But to punish from what I've heard, $20 million, get rid of it. No, look at that list. There's a literacy program on there. Are we not teaching every book? Oh, I'm sorry, I can't teach Clockwork Orange anymore because it's a book I don't like. But we all, there's 70 different points of view here. I 
would like to think it's a balance, that we can find that balance, because that's what our state of Idaho needs, is a balance of our views, of our choices that every family makes in this state. We will never all look like one. We are different and we have got to let some of those differences be seen. Whether we pass this budget or not, that will be 70 votes. But to say that JFAC needs to go and just rattle it and do what I want done is unfair. We need to respect our colleagues. I truly believe this body will do what's right. Um, we don't all agree, but I hope we hold that balance in place as we cast our votes. Is there further debate? Uh, good gentleman from District 17. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, you know, it, it's pretty clear that there is a there is controversy that there is some kind of uh, gap in communication. And I'd like to suggest that there are ways to solve that uh, rather than in a budget debate uh, at the end of session. And those ways could be an interim committee. It could be having forums uh, with both sides present and let's find out what the problem is and what the source is and who's doing what. Um, I think we I think we need to do something along those lines rather than than taking one person one student's email or one person's viewpoint and saying the whole system is bad and the the thing that I re I know about Boise State is they have a great engineering program they have a great nursing school program. Uh, two, uh, two programs that are totally necessary for our economy and our economic development and for the students' development. Uh, I've known a lot of kids that have gone to Boise State, uh, um, my, my children's friends, and, uh, and so it's a lot, there's a lot of good that comes as a result of the university education. That having been said, if there is a problem, let's get to the bottom of it, and because there's been and and I would I would uh, the good gentleman from I can't uh, good gentleman uh, from Rexburg uh, number he's on the phone at any rate 34. He's done a wonderful job I think uh, he and his group have done a wonderful job of inviting all of us to uh, meetings where we've had people uh, of different viewpoints and uh, where we've been able to share uh, some of the, or, or at least become knowledgeable in some of the issues and problems that we have. And I've really appreciated those meetings that, uh, that, that have been put on. And I think we need more of those. And I think we need, uh, Pro and that's why I almost come to the idea of an interim committee, balanced interim committee, where we get both sides uh, coming in and discussing the problems. Those are ways to solve the problem because, uh, or at least take important steps towards solving the communication problem, which it seems like we, we have. We didn't used to have this problem, uh, and it's arisen over the past year. Uh, let's look at doing something like that. I hate to to punish all the good that is ha being accomplished at our universities and at Boise State in particular. Um, it, I'd rather get at the problem and let's let's sur be a little more surgical in our approach and uh, take care of that that business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Bate. Uh, gentleman from 19. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I just want to publicly apologize to the good gentleman from four because I am absolutely going to disregard his request for a no vote. 
and here's why. And I don't need an email. I don't need to tell a story about it. something I heard from another student. I'm going to tell a personal story. When I was in college, when I was an upper level student, I was taking a methodologies course. This is at one of our public colleges and universities. And we were all given our final end of the semester summaries on the original research that we did. And one of my colleagues, I remember his name. I remember him standing up and he was talking about his methodology and proceeded to tell in front of the class. He said, talking about his survey methodology, he said, and of, of all of the people I interviewed, Madam Professor, 95 or 96 percent were white. And then, quote, the rest were just minorities. My head was on a swivel. I looked at the professor. The professor didn't say anything. Long story short, this kid went off and got crushed in a global labor market. I'm not voting yes, or I'm not voting no, because I don't want to send the message that we should punish our colleges and universities more for trying to do their small part in a much bigger challenge. And I understand that we feel like we are trying to stand up for students who are going through tough times, but let's be honest, we're talking about certain students. And this is a recent phenomenon. No one came to my rescue when I was being racially othered, when I was being cast aside as lesser than. And I'm not ready to, and I don't think we want to have, and I would love to have real deep conversations on critical race theory and evolution theory and all the theories and how being exposed to these ideas is critical and good for business, good for workforce development, good for Idaho's reputation, but I won't do that here. I just want to explain why I don't think we should take more of the very few resources we already give to our universities as a matter of their operating budget. We shouldn't take more money, and that's not a message that I want to send, so I'll be voting yes. Is there further debate? The lady from District 1. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You were looking the other way. Oh, I, I saw you out of the corner of my eye. So um, the good lady from 26 mentioned balance, and that's what I wanted to talk about a little bit, balance. Um, this budget is $630 million for four schools, four colleges, when we have seven budgets for over 1,700 schools for our, our regular K through 12 schools. So we have so much money packed into one budget. And what I would like to see JFAC do is consider at least separating those out into four main budgets so we can look deeper. As we can see, there's a ton of problems that we're having. And, um, and, and there's no way to really look deeper into a school when it's just an all or nothing package. Um, that's one of my concerns. Um, another concern I have is I, I pass this um, out on, on um, high paid um, employees of our state and, and professors are employees of our state, college workers are employees of our state and 188 of the top 250 highest paid people in our state are working at our universities. Maybe that's something we need to look into a little deeper. It, it just seems out of control. Sticking with the theme of money, um, when I look at this, um, this handout from the, district, the gentleman from District 34, uh, these are whole departments set up that are teaching this nonsense. Um, and then I see all the money that's putting through the actual classes, it's really hard to pick that stuff out when you don't, um, when you don't see things as individuals. You can't just group these into one big conglomerate. Um, and I, I, I felt really bad for BSU because we're picking on them, but there's tons of examples from these other colleges. And I, I spent a lot of time with testimony, and I know nobody wants to hear it. So I'll probably send you an email of that sometime later. But I, I do want to say that, you know, Lewis and Clark, they're doing this too. Um, they are saying that there's no apolitical classrooms. Um, these, these, these schools are actually putting this agenda, they're, they're training um, development, what, what's it called for teachers? Um, 
I don't have it, but pro professional development. And they're sending these teachers into training to teach them how to indoctrinate students with this social justice agenda. And I will, I will email this to you so I won't bore you with it, but we really need to look at these colleges and, and look down deeper into their money. If they've got that much money to pay people so much, they've got that much money to do um, as what University of Idaho is doing, F word poetry slams and safe zone trainings, um, they probably maybe are getting too much money. So I, I'd like to see this reduced substantially, but I also like to see it divided into a couple different, pr probably four, or we could go north and south. I'd be fine with that for colleges, but um, something a, a little deeper that we can dig into. Thank you. Is there further debate? Good lady from district, I forget. 17, is 17, it? 17, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, I, I've really been listening with my heart today and uh, I do hear you when you talk about a student that's trying to get through campus and has to go through a shame tunnel and uh, all these kind of indignities because it's something that I really, really, truly understand. And I got to tell you that when I see these quote unquote social justice curricula, I actually was very happy to see it because it's our means by which we get our freedom. There are things that seem to be clung to us as we've grown older uh, that are biases that we don't even see. Now, how can we get free of that? It's through training so that we can see with eyes that really do see. Otherwise, we're a little provincial. So, you know, the thing is, is that um, these opportunities I don't get anywhere else. It's very hard. Sometimes you get it at work. But to be able to see this in school is the way that I hope Idahoans are able to strip ourselves of the things that imprison us so that we can truly be free. Thank you. Speaker. Uh, good gentleman from District 2, for what purpose do you rise? I move that we vote immediately. So you're moving the previous question? Yes, Mr. Speaker, I'm okay. moving the previous question. Okay. Uh, that is a non-debatable motion. Oh, it takes two thirds. Is there a second? There is. Uh, the good gentleman for District 3 uh, seconded. And, uh, and gentleman from 4? Mr. Speaker, I need to make a point of order. Point of order. Uh, I need to, uh, if I'm not able to close debate, I need to declare a rule 80. My wife is an employee at the University of Idaho. Well, that would have been in order even before we placed it. So, yes, but your declaration on a rule 80 will be noted. Lady from 18, point thank, of order. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Point of order, I need to declare rule 80 as well. I serve on the board that of the Honors your College. Declaration. We have, is that indicative of how you're going to vote? A uh, gentleman from 29. Same. Your declaration will be noted as well. So we have a, so the, the previous question has been moved and seconded. It is non-debatable and requires two thirds of the members present for passage. The clerk will unlock the machine and the members will record their votes on the motion to, uh, to suspend debate and vote. Two thirds. Has every member voted? Representative Nekachea. Representative Clow. Does any member wish to change his vote? The clerk will lock the machine and record the vote. The vote count shows 47 in favor with 23 against, two thirds having voted in the affirmative. Uh, the previous question is moved. Uh, we'll proceed to the vote. Uh, before that, any other declarations or any other 
in order things. Hearing none, the clerk uh, call the call the vote. So the question before us is: Shall Senate Bill 1179 pass? The clerk will unlock the machine. Not yet. Okay. When the clerk unlocks the machine, the members will record their votes. Has every member voted? Does any member wish to change his vote? The clerk will lock the machine and record the vote. Vote count shows 12 in favor with 58 against. Senate Bill 1179 has failed to pass the House and will be returned to the Senate.